obviously based off of the what, 1939, very, 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 very short story by James Thurber, yeah, which would take about two minutes to film. Right, but that, that's an asset that sometimes to have less um, to work with. You get to um, open up your imagination. And, Do what you want. Yeah, well, well um, there was a spirit there in the short story that I think uh, we hope to um, sustain. I think he put a name on a an American um, archetype, like the the daydreamer, the guy who is in jeopardy of letting his better days um, come and go because he's too busy imagining a different future for himself than than the one he's living. So here, so here's the thing. And you're setting me up for jokes. I there's no tell. joke. There's no yeah. bit. This is not a bit. You're. This is. There's absolutely no bit at all. All right. I'll just. This is a to This is like the most serious question I've ever asked. No, it's not. Uh, <laughs> no, it's not. I was telling a friend, I said, hey, you know, I, I just saw Secret Walter, Life of Walter Mitty, and I, God, I was really, I really, really liked it. And he's like, I liked it too, and I totally related to the character. And I was like, no, you didn't, because I related to the character. And then we talked about how everybody relates to the Walter Mitty character. But then I thought, you know what, to my friend, you're married, you've got a good life, you've got a good job, I've got the same thing going on. That's almost not fair to the people who actually are the Walter Mitty's, but yet we all have that inside of us. It, well, yeah, probably. I mean, it's, it's, you never stop, I hope that people never stop doing it because it's a way to, um, to increase, it's a way to um, um, become greater and, and more. I think people should daydream about how to be better uh, husbands and um, fathers. And um, it, it's aspiration, aspiration, it, it's, a, it's a cool thing. Um, you can feel stupid about how you spend your time daydreaming. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Like no, I, I, I daydream about being a good father and good <laughs> husband. Yeah. But I also daydream that I'm Bruce Springsteen sometimes. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. For, and then I'm like, for, why am I doing sure. that? Stop doing that. You're not Bruce Springsteen. For what sure. is and you probably will never be Bruce Springsteen. I hate to break that to you. I'm only 40. <laughs> yeah. Well, so what your, your question is... You're pinning that on me to no, explain how what people make peace with n not reaching their... Uh, no, but that's a good question. Yeah, well, you, you never will, probably. Yeah. It's, it's all of our sort of um, fates to, to make peace with the life we expected um, versus the life that we've earned, right? Well, and that's probably when you become... I don't know grown if anybody up. ever reaches happiness, but a grown No, no, up right, and you there. find... Uh, hopefully you find peace of mind somewhere there at, at those crossroads. So then the question is, and this is a question that I think everybody struggles with, especially as they get older, is when do you stop, or maybe, is it, how do you, how are you both satisfied with the status quo and yet you still keep yeah, striving? Yeah, that's a brilliant question. And you, you might ask that question by uh, asking, when, when, do, when do you come embarrassed by your daydreams? Like when do you think your daydreams haven't matured, your daydreams haven't grown? Um, increased, gotten sounder or wiser or more responsible. I don't know, 45, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> How old are you? 45. <laughs> <laughs> the kids are smiling because they're polite. I can tell. <laughs> there are a lot of kids here. I've never been in an audience where the people are in, enduring my part of it and are also so small. <laughs> no. <laughs> It's going down right now. <laughs> let, me, let me ask you, this is, I hope this question doesn't uh, bother you, but it might, and I'll have to deal with that for, for the rest of the interview, if not forever. <laughs> but that is that there was an interesting phenomenon. The movie comes out, and I know, and it gets some good reviews, some medium reviews, a lot of not so good reviews, but then if you go to Google Play, or you go to iTunes, or you go to Amazon, or wherever you might watch it online, the audience reviews, there's tons of them, and it's, it's four to five stars. Can you make sense of that? No, I think that the minute you, I, I try to pay very little attention to that, because it's, in as much as I've been plugged into it, it's been the opposite with my other movies. Um, I think this is my seventh movie or sixth movie, and it, it's usually the opposite. I, I, I can't tell. I mean, the minute you become paralyzed when you start to, to wonder about that part of it, it's, it you can't control it. It's not up to you. Um, Times the Revelator, audiences uh, will watch movies twice only if they affect them deeply. And um, 
I, I would love it to be able to be said about my films, some of my films, that people watch them twice, like uh, the movies that I, I watch two or three times. And I've wondered about that, like among the movies that I can't stop watching. Um, I can name a few, and they're all over the place. And maybe I should just think about it for a second, because um, I think the, um, the conclusion will be you, you just don't know what it is about a movie that works for you ultimately. The movies I probably watched more than once this year, um, Sexy Beast, Third Man, The Birdcage, um, Punch Drunk Love. Yeah. But I mean, you know, you, you could you um, run circles to try to figure out what those movies have in common. But then there's movies that you love that you say, I, I never want to see that again. No, really? Yeah, sure. We're, like what? Oh, now I'm putting on the spot. I don't know, The Birdcage. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's straight, man. <laughs> I don't know. Couldn't think of any. I don't mind being your straight man. No, not at all. As long as it's like 15 minutes. <laughs> um, well, one thing about one thing I really did like uh, about the movie, and I obviously assume that it was intentional and something that you worked on with the other filmmakers, is that there there is this great mix of melancholy and just kind of a, a very real but real quirkiness and, and a movie that I watch many many times and it's very different from this movie but is LA Story and that movie had both of those things yeah. and I'm wondering if that's something that, that you've got going on in your mind well I think about I, I think I um, whenever I I start to write enough where you feel like you can identify that what this movie's trying to do I, I generally have a conflict because m my movies specifically don't have a genre exactly and they're often criticized for that. And, and largely, if, if uh, you could sum up the reaction initially to Walter Mitty is that it, it has tonal imbalance. But um, I, um, the, the, when you could make, when filmmakers were making movies without genres like Charlie Chaplin, when the, the art form was so young that there was no such thing as genres yet, the filmmakers chose to confuse a few different kinds of feelings. The, um, he ate a shoe and, and made you laugh. He was so hungry that he ate a shoe and made you laugh while he was eating his shoe. And I, I take a cue from that instinct, which is to pay zero attention to limitations initially and just try to uh, follow some direction to like my life. Like I like people who are alternately serious and silly the most. And if I have friends who are only one or the other, they don't last very long in my life. And I don't think that I ought to regard movies any differently. Speaking of, of Chaplin, I was having this discussion this morning actually with a friend, which was about comedy and why some comedies seem to last and then other comedies, you can, you can interact. Yeah, they have a say. very short shelf life. They, they try to get your kids interested in um, and comedies, it's tough. They'll, they'll watch The Third Man, but it's hard to get them to watch uh, um, a Mel Brooks movie. And yeah. He, yeah, or I want to show my son Airplane, and I'm afraid to, because I think, what if he hates it? <laughs> what if the colors seem all faded to him? Yeah, he doesn't have to wear glasses. Well, to I would watch love it. to hear. I would love to hear what happened, because chances are it won't work for them. But there's a movie that's taken its place for them. Right. Which yeah. is worse. No. Yeah, but it's no, just it's not. Life. But there, but, but there are some it. comedies, and I think Chaplin is one of them, and I don't understand why. That for me, I watch it and I'm like, oh, that is still really funny and really brilliant. And then there's others, and I know I'm going to get booze here, but I watch the Marx Brothers and I don't yeah. get it as much. Well, you know, you love them because they're personal, and you can't force them on other people because they're, they're personal. They'll have their own personal movies, but they will have movies. In my, um, in my life, uh, my, there's a movie called Pitch Perfect, which is like our, it's our Grease. And I try to get my kids to like Grease and they love Pitch Perfect. And, and then I watch Pitch Perfect. That This is an extremely well-directed movie that does what Grease did. I'm too old to, to love it, but they're too young to love Grease. And um, it, I, you just have to accept those, those terms, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about this, uh, this new thing you have going on, which, which is, is called Tim's Valley, and and it the it's a what stop motion animation using baby dolls, but that doesn't quite do it justice. Well, so. they're not just but they're baby dolls repurposed as adults. Right. And the 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 show is a um, it's a riff on 
early 80s era primetime soaps like Dynasty or uh, um, what, what were the other ones then? Not Fal- Falcon Crest. Exactly, exactly. But uh, yes, we've taken these, these dolls and redressed them as grown-ups, and they, they're, they're grown-ups for all intents and purposes. They serve as, as puppets for the most part. We, so the, it's on, the, the pilot's on YouTube, Tim's Valley. The, the, do- the dolls are incredible. Where, where did, you, did you, did you just spend a lot of time in like American Girl Place, creeping everybody out? Like- no, no, I have two partners on this show, two longtime Chicago film guys, Jeff Dieter and Tom Glennon. Um, Jeff was just doing this to make art out of them, taking, and I think his theory was that it, if you turn a baby doll into a grown up, it draws out uh, the immaturity that adults can walk around with. And um, it, like a, a baby doll, with male pattern baldness, <laughs> just clues you in on just the the struggle against that, and it, I thought it's a great it's a way to be comic about life on Earth. But there's something. I mean, there's a there's a character who is kind of the, I think it's referred to in the pilot as the the male Paris Hilton, and he it's a it's a doll, but he looks like the ultimate douchebag. Sorry, kids, uh, and and yet. He looks more like a douchebag because, because he's a baby doll. doll. Yeah, you just, we, we shouldn't talk about it because you just have to check it out. Don't yeah. you agree that it's just something well, What the hell that... is the point of the show then if we can't? <laughs> yeah. I, it defies, it really defies description. And it's it one d- of it does, it yeah. does. You send it to me this morning, you're like, check this out. And I'm like, oh, fuck, I've got to change the whole interview now. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not. I'm not selling it, I, but it's what I'm going to do this year if I, if I have my way. Yeah. When you get, and it could be Walter Mitty, or it could be this film. Is there any part of you that says, God, I really, really want to do that, but I'm kind of scared because people have oh, such... Oh, maybe I was, I was terrified. When we found out it was going to be a Christmas movie, I've never tackled a movie that size. The the, um, the exposure you have then, and you, you can flop. And I've always stopped short of uh, being able to say that about anything I've worked on just because the ambition was never that great. Yeah, well, I mean, but everybody, we, we started to film the movie before we realized it was going to be a holiday release, which it just imposes different demands on the success of the movie. But then I thought, I, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go for that because I, I'm, my kids were old enough that I was watching movies with them, and I thought if I do this, if we get it right, if we're writing about a real human uh, longing, kids will, kids will get it. I mean, 12-year-olds will get it. And um, I think they, I think they do. So I just regarded it as a, as a different kind of challenge. But the job itself was impossible to turn down because um, you are allowed a limitless uh, palette for things you might conceive. Anything you could think of could conceivably be in the movie because because of the budget. Well, well, the budget, yeah. But but the 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 guy is a daydreamer, and whatever he oh, okay. whatever he calls story. to mind, you can pop into the story. Yeah. And it seemed just like my real life. Like the struggle is to focus, to not uh, imagine a better future than the one you know you're in the middle of. Um, so I thought it's I, I, there's a chance we can tell a story that people might recognize because I, I do think that no matter what your walk of life is, you you spend a lot of time wishing things were different. Do you think that's true for? Is that a universal truth? I think so. I, I mean, I really do. I, I, um, I ought to be perfectly content with my walk of life, but I, I fight against uh, the, the next thing, you know, just trying to um, grow or make more noise. And um, I, I, I mean, if you, the minute you become... Einstein has this great quote that he just tossed off in a letter to his son that said, life... Uh, it, it's like a it's like riding a bicycle. If you stop moving, you'll lose your balance. And I, but I think people regard moving um, as um, getting greater rather than um, problem solving or tending to things that need. Uh, as Americans, we we get it forced down our throats that we're expected to be great. And I talked about this a little bit in other interviews for Mitty, but you. When I was a kid, you, you couldn't get 15 minutes from waking up before someone thrust the breakfast of champions in your face and you had to think, well, I just want to have breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> and Mark Spitz is sitting there with six gold medals and you, 
and you haven't finished your Spanish homework, which you're going to get a C on if you're lucky. But you know so, what? So, so, but but the, the point is, you as an American, you're you're driven to to win, not just to um, to to succeed. You, you're you can't just succeed; you have to win. And I, I don't think it's a bad thing. It might be a really good thing. I mean, like today's equivalent maybe of looking at the Wheaties box, but I will, you know, in the morning or in the afternoon or in the evening or in between those times, go onto Twitter and I will just see all of these things that are happening, all these people who are saying things and doing things, and I'll think, God, well, that is both absolutely amazing and inspiring, but it's also completely exhausting at the same time. Yeah, to, to keep up with it. To keep up with it yeah. or just to take it in that all of this is happening. Yeah, yeah. Well, man, to say, to say the least that that's true. But that's the fight of everybody's life, I think, is just to uh, gain enough um, satisfaction personally that's sound and sober-minded that feels like you you just put forth effort for some something that deserved it versus something that just, that just doesn't. Do you like, do you prefer a two-month period where you are rushing around from thing to thing, busy as anything, or a two-month period where you've done it and you're just sitting back, if that ever well, happens. I, you know, one of the weird realizations of growing up life for me is how little sitting back there ever is. Like, you either are doing too many things or you're getting beat. And there's there's one gear in the gearbox. It's fifth or it's failure. And um, you can't share that with anybody else. It's your own private sort of set of... Uh, drives but um you can't change it either it's just what the, the challenge that life has presented you with so but it's uh it's it might be particular to 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 being an uh, an adult american i don't know but you realize pretty quickly you better stop thinking about it and you better just do it or you're going to get lapped up 